Over 35 years of real estate investing, never have I seen such opportunity as we're about to see over the next couple of years. I've been looking for this opportunity for over 10 years. The real estate market is short about 6 million housing units. What this is gonna do, gonna create significant pressure on both pricing and rent. Over the next couple of years, what you will see is all the new supply that started several years ago is gonna be added to the economy in 2024 and 2025. That's gonna cause a little bit of disruption in the markets for about two years. And that's gonna show up in the form of flat rents, concessions, and possibly even pricing. Once that pig goes through the python, as I like to say, after that, the genie's out of the bottle. The supply goes way down and the demand stays steady and that's when we're gonna to start to see massive, massive price increases and massive rent increases. So the opportunity for real estate investing is going to be in these next two years when you can buy distressed assets from developers that are sitting on construction loans, really high rate loans, or even owners that are undercapitalized or possibly even occupancy problems. So for those of you who are skeptical, just take a look at the following graph. Then on the left side are completions. Now these are both single family and multifamily. And at the bottom is the year. Please focus on 2006, when you can see that the US added about 1.8 million units of housing. The red represents multifamily and the blue represents single family. And this bubble was created by low interest rates at the time. We've all heard of 2008, 2007. Well, you can see the drop off right after that and that's what ensued next. So during this period of time, no banks were lending for new construction because what had happened up to that 2006 timeframe is we added a lot more housing than we needed. Now, if you're a buyer or you're a renter, this was a good time for you because when new supply is being added into the market, there's more options, more options for rent, more options to buy. And that actually is what it takes to mitigate pricing. From a consumer standpoint, this is what you want. From a landlord or an owner standpoint, this is not what we want. We do not want a lot of supply because of course, we're subject to the marketplace. But please pay attention to what happened from 2006 after. As you can see, there's a huge gap in additional units being added. Now the United States needs about 1.5 million units of housing just to keep up with the population growth. This is an important point because you can just look at the graph and see that we had many, many years of undersupply almost 20 years of undersupply. So we are just now today meeting what the economy needs. But as a result of the last 18 to 20 years, we are negative about five to six million housing units. This is the opportunity. This is precisely why housing prices have gone up and rents have gone up and rents will continue to go up after these last couple of years, housing units get absorbed. So just using simple math, the US needs about 1.5 million units of housing. Prior to 2006, you can see that this fluctuated up and down for many, many years. But what happened was the consumer benefited because additional supply kept prices down, kept rents down. Additional supply actually helps pricing. So pricing was stable and rents were stable prior to 2006. Once the crash happened in 2008 and those banks started taking back all that housing, once that was all absorbed by about 2011, 2012, we actually got into a housing shortage again. So in 2008 and 2009, when all the banks started taking back all that real estate, what happened was they turned the faucet off. They stopped lending, especially for new construction because typically new construction is the most risky type of a loan for housing. So like in any market, when a lot of supply hits the market at once that nobody wants, it actually starts to reduce pricing, the pricing of housing and the pricing of rent. So when people fell out of single family homes, they fell into multifamily, they fell into rentals. That put a lot of pressure on the multifamily sector. So that's actually what we just saw. What we saw was a number of people moving out of the single family market into the multifamily market, into rentals, which put a lot of pressure 
on the multifamily side. That's when we started to see all these syndicators jump in because they were seeing this massive rent growth. It was simply as a result of the hangover from the GFC. So prior to 2006, people started buying housing that obviously couldn't afford it. Then what happened was that bubble popped. This was simply, once again, cheap money chasing housing given to people that couldn't afford it in the first place. That popped later and that resulted in a significant amount of supply. When all that supply started coming back to the banks, because banks aren't supposed to own real estate, then they stopped lending and the whole market pulled back, kind of like what we're about ready to see now. The difference is that we don't have a bubble in the single family market. We have a bubble in the commercial real estate market. So if you're a bank, you're indifferent because it's still a loan. So one loan is to somebody personally, individually for a single family, but another loan at the same bank might be to an office building that is now suffering from high vacancy due to work from home and other kinds of reasons. So what are we seeing in the commercial real estate market? What we're seeing is the lenders have pulled back and they're actually lowering their loan to value. So if you guys know what that is, you take the value of your property and they loan a percentage against that value. So those loan to values are 50, 55, and even 60%. So they've lowered the loan to values as they were just a couple of years ago. Said another way, they're requiring more equity to be able to buy the same property that they were just a couple of years ago. That is a very good reflection of the, what the banks are thinking right now, is when they lower the loan to value, it should signal to you that they're concerned about the amount of risk in the marketplace. I'm speaking from personal experience because we have construction loans and regular properties that we own and have bought. And we're trying to work with the same lenders that we were just working with a couple of years ago. And they're requiring more of a down payment and less of a loan to value because also don't forget interest rates are higher too. Commercial real estate values are already affected negatively as they devalued over the last couple of years, as interest rates went up, as so did cap rates and capitalization rates drive the value of the properties. The irony is that a lot of these commercial real estate deals, they're actually performing at about what they were just a few years ago. The difference is they're 20 to 30% less in value. With the exception, of course, with some multifamily, a lot of retail, and of course, office buildings are in big, big trouble as a result of work from home. And of course, the shadow vacancy as we've been talking about on this channel, which is simply people that are paying for leases, but nobody's showing up to go to the office. They're just literally waiting for those leases to end so they don't renew. So we cover supply and you can clearly see that we need supply in order to keep up with demand and we're already well behind. So the other thing to watch are certainly the migration patterns that we started to see from the pandemic but also what happens when big employers move in and move out of areas, creating supply and demand problems. For example, I had a property in Western Washington and the state of Washington decided to shut down a big nuclear power plant. And this property was located right near that plant. Once that power plant shut down, the entire town changed for good. The same thing happened in many towns in the United States, whether it's McDonald, Ohio, when Carnegie Steel pulled out, or Empire, Nevada, when U.S. Gypsum pulled out, or Pullman, Illinois, when the Pullman Palace Car Company pulled out. When big employers pull out of certain markets, the employees that were once employed there, they used to pay rent, buy homes, use the grocery stores and all that stuff, are migrating to other areas. And the same thing is true when people are leaving for other reasons. So just a decade ago, I would say that most people were moving primarily because of jobs. But now people are moving for lots of other reasons. A couple notable ones are, of course, the high prices of tax. So people are looking at, what does it cost for me to live in a certain area? And that might be sales tax, it might be property tax, whatever it is. It might just be a tax on you living somewhere, which we've seen in a lot of different states like California. So it should be no surprise that the number one state that is losing the most amount of people is of course California. People are also leaving as a result of safety and things like politics. So just Google the 10 states people are fleeing and the 10 states are people are moving to, you'll see it right in black and white. As people are moving, they're actually saying why. Primarily, 
it's a result of housing affordability, high taxes, safety, and of course, politics. So the top states, as reported by the U.S. Postal Service, Department of Motor Vehicles, U-Haul, North American Bad Lines, are Texas, Florida, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Arizona. That is where right now everyone seems to be going as a result of all the things we just discussed. So I want you to imagine what that would look like if 100,000 people moved into Texas in one calendar year. Now, of course, Texas is big and they could be moving into different cities, but primarily that's been focused on just three counties. And when that many people move, let's say to three counties in the state of Texas, it's going to put a lot of pressure on all the services in that particular county. It's gonna put pressure on the school system. It's gonna put pressure on getting a reservation at a restaurant. It's going to put pressure on rent. It's going to put pressure on housing. All of those things have additional pressure as more people move in because now you have, so now you have extra demand on existing infrastructure and supply in a particular area which is just driving the prices up as it does naturally. And I'm not saying to go buy real estate in these markets. I'm just merely saying to you that without people, real estate doesn't have any income. So pay attention to whether or not the market is growing. Pay attention to if people are leaving, pay attention to whether people are going or coming. But most importantly, you wanna make sure that whatever you're buying is cash flowing. Cash flow first, value second. Obviously you want both. You're not trying to time a market and buy low and sell high. That is not real estate investing. That's gambling, that's flipping, that's trying to time the market and that's dangerous. What we're trying to do here is find markets that are growing as a result of demand. Be in front of that, don't be a pioneer and take advantage of the price growth, the rent growth, but at the same time, make sure that cash flows. If you buy something and no one wants to be there, it's not gonna be a good deal. If you buy something and everyone is moving there, you're going to look like a hero. As you guys know, things are still quite expensive and interest rates are high, but I can assure you, we've got a small window of time here where a lot of supply is going to be added for 24 and 25. That's gonna create a little bit of disruption in the market. Hopefully, in these markets that are really growing from a population and a migration standpoint, you can capitalize on an oversupply in a temporary scenario for this next year. So if I was going to look at a market today, I would look at two things. The first thing I would look at is I would want to make sure that the amount of people moving to that area over the next few years was solid and steady and it created an ongoing demand because that ongoing demand will put a lot of pressure on the real estate both on the rents, of course, and of course, on the single family housing prices. The second thing I would look for is try to find that same market that is currently oversupplied. In other words, maybe a big builder's there, maybe a lot of people are, are starting to build projects in that particular area. There's a temporary oversupply of housing, which, which has created housing prices to go flat, rail prices to go flat, possibly even concessions. What you wanna look for are houses that have been on the market for a long time or days on market. And you wanna look for rents that have high concessions. That's a market that is currently out of balance. You wanna find that, you wanna find those deals because that's what you wanna buy. You're gonna know that if you can buy that property at a discount today, you'll know that the market will solve that for you when the people start to migrate to that area. So here's why I think that we have such an incredible opportunity. The first thing is, People are hanging on interest rates. They're not going down anytime soon. And even if they do a little bit, it's not gonna be significant. So what we're seeing today in the real estate market, we're gonna see for many years to come. The second thing that's happened is that the migration patterns have significantly changed the way real estate is priced in many different markets. There are people moving out of markets, which is creating a negative effect on those markets. And there are people moving into markets, which is creating a positive effect on those markets. The third thing is we have a massive affordability problem. So right now, the average cost of a single family home is well over 400, and the average cost of rent is over $2,000 a month. This has created a massive affordability problem for most Americans. So the real problem that we have 
is the lack of supply or the underbuilding of America for the last 18 years. We have a five to six million dollar housing supply shortage. This is not gonna change anytime soon. So as a real estate investor, I'm gonna take advantage of the migration patterns, the lack of affordability, and the current interest rates to be able to lock in my price today, hedge inflation, and wait for the shortage of housing to do its thing. Because the politicians are not going to allow more housing, and they're certainly not gonna lower interest rates again like we just had, because that, of course, is just gonna create another real estate bubble, which we're already in. And let's say all of a sudden, interest rates come down and they start to favor new construction. Well, even if they do that today, it's not gonna significantly hit the market for a couple of years or more because it takes a long time to get a property built and of course occupied. So there's a lag effect with what is ever started today. So there's a lag effect with whatever starts, let's say in 2024, it's really not gonna show up until 2025 anyway. If you guys wanna see what the biggest risks to the real estate market in 2024 are, Click on this next video.